Welcome to the LSU Sports Insider, brought to you by the journalists at The Advocate, NOLA.com, Times Picayune. Perrin Keyes here with, uh, it's a, on a very special LSU Sports Insider episode, uh, we brought the, uh, the two veterans here, Scott Rabelais to my left, to your right, our venerable longtime columnist, and Sheldon Mickles, our venerable longtime beat writer, sports writer extraordinaire, uh, two, well, soon to be two members of the Louisiana Sports Hall of Fame. Hopefully we'll get that squared away at some point here with you, Rab. Mm. That's right. Uh, to my right, Sheldon uh, has 46? 46. 46 years of experience at The Advocate. To my left, Scott Rabelais has? Almost 35. They're almost 35 years of experience. Uh, I personally have 15 and change. <laughs> if we did the math and that's correct, it's 96 years of advocate experience coming to you live today, as I said, on a very special LSU Sports Insider. Uh, we, are, uh, we typically come here, obviously, to you on Mondays and Thursdays. We will probably reduce that schedule here as we get into the dog days of summer, of course. Not as much quite to talk about, but uh, when we do, when we do come back, we will be on uh, all our social channels, of course. Uh, specifically the, uh, the LSU Tigers on NOLA.com YouTube channel. Uh, if you go to YouTube and search for LSU Tigers on NOLA.com, you should be able to find us there. You can follow along, subscribe. That way you'll never miss an episode, and you can catch us live on that channel. Uh, and if you don't catch us live, you can always catch us after the fact. We are also on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, wherever other finer podcasts are found. Uh, and, you know, we brought, uh, we brought the two vets in uh, along with myself because uh, it's a good reminder uh, that nobody for years and years now has covered the, uh, covered the LSU sports programs like The Advocate, and that will, uh, that will never change. So you should join the, join the party and stay up to date with everything, all things LSU with The Advocate. Uh, subscribe. Please go to theadvocate.com slash subscribe. And as I said, join the party. Uh, and to stay up in touch with every, uh, stay up to date and stay in touch with everything, uh, you should uh, you should take a look at the LSU Sports Insider newsletter. Uh, it's the LSU newsletter. It comes out seven days a week, goes straight to your inbox. You get all the headlines delivered straight there. You don't have to go looking all over the internet for the latest news. It is delivered straight to your phone, to your desktop, to your inbox. Rab handles that three times a week personally, uh, but it's a daily newsletter. So sign up for it at theadvocate.com slash LSU newsletter. Uh, I brought these two guys here in uh, today because I wanted to have a little fun. Uh, I uh, was getting dressed today, and I, uh, I specifically picked uh, my blue tie here, my McKinley blue tie, uh, because I was uh, reminded of the fact that at one point I was a wee lad. Uh, I moved here uh, to Louisiana when I was 13 years old, went to McKinley High School, uh, and I grew up reading The Advocate, and I grew up grew up reading these two guys in The Advocate. And I also, there's uh, somebody who should be here, honestly, uh, along with the party. She doesn't cover LSU very often, but she does cover high school sports like nobody else in the United States. She's a member of two halls of fame, uh, and she knows, I've told her many times, that uh, it was the coolest thing in the world to be at McKinley High School at the big game, the big basketball game or whatever, and to see Robin Fambro walk through the doorway and you say, wow, man, Robin from the paper is here. And man, it's This so is cool. the game of the week. That's yeah. the, this is the biggest game of the night. You know right. you're in the biggest game of the city that night. Robin Fambro from the paper uh, was there. And so uh, it's been a great thrill in my life, professionally and personally, uh, that I've gotten to say over the past uh, five or 12 years, however you want to look at it, uh, to be able to say that I'm their boss, I'm their supervisor, but uh, those days are coming to an end soon. This will be my last uh, LSU Sports Insider podcast. I will be leaving for greener pastures, actually probably snowier pastures, but we'll get to that <laughs> announcement at some other point. Uh, so, gentlemen, I do appreciate you guys uh, coming into the show, coming in to wrap this thing up and wrap up the LSU sports season for this year. Absolutely. Wouldn't have missed it. <laughs> for the world. Yeah. yeah. You might have missed it. You well, might have missed it if there were a plane ticket or a cheesecake factory going someplace. Well, you, had, so. you had better options. Maybe so. Well, uh, at any rate, we will, uh, we're, we're going to, uh, actually, the LSU sports season really isn't over. We're going to discuss, uh, obviously, the LSU men's and women's track teams up in Eugene, Oregon. That's, uh, we're in the middle of uh, NCAA Nationals right now, and uh, maybe the LSU women particularly uh, could hunt down yet another national championship to close out. Uh, the 23-24 sports season. Uh, but, gentlemen, to start off, I just I, I wanted to go through LSU's greatest hits uh, from 2023 and 2024. And uh, with that, I would just open it up to you, Rab. I'll, I'll put you on the spot. What do you? What was the highest of the highlights uh, for this past sports season, starting, starting from the fall and going all the way through the spring? Well, um, 
I, I'm probably supposed to say Jaden Daniels winning the Heisman mm-hmm. Trophy, but that was you know and while it was a great achievement. He had a great season and and, and uh, uh, totally deserving. I would say you know the, it was tinged a little bit by the fact that the defense was so bad, and you're like, boy, this could have been like 2019 if the defense had, had just been decent, and they weren't. They were abysmal. Yes. Uh, so that, that that that's not quite there. So uh, considering that I've covered gymnastics so long, I have to say the LSU gymnastics team finally winning the national championship uh, in, in in dramatic fashion and. In April, you know they they uh, to use a hockey term, uh, they uh, they hang around the goal. You hang around the goal long enough, eventually you're going to score, and that's what they did. They they've been national runner up four times, and uh, I've covered a bunch of those meets. Sheldon's been at, at some of those meets, and uh, you're like, well, are they ever going to break through? And then you know they had the opportunity. Oklahoma just fell apart on the vault in the in the national semifinals, and uh, uh, LSU was like, okay, they're suddenly the favorite, and the, and they came through. And to see. Um, as I said on our last podcast, one of my favorite things in sports is to see an athlete perform on the biggest stage in a way maybe they've never done before. That was Sierra Ballard leading off on, on beam with a 9.95, her career high. It's just like Jasmine Carson in the final last year, or, or you know, it was just uh, uh, in the uh, basketball final. So, yeah, I'll have to say that that was the, that was the highlight for me was, was covering that, that meet and being there to watch history be made. We know that uh, – we know that uh – we knew going in, and as is typically the case, that Oklahoma was sort of the, the presumptive favorite. Um, and we thought that it was – going into that championship, we said – we actually said on this podcast that, uh, you know, LSU can win, but something's going to have to happen. You know, Oklahoma's going to have to have a – or LSU's going to have just to have to have, you know, back-to-back performances. Everybody's going to have to have the performance mm-hmm. of their lifetime. And so I think, uh, Rab, you and I discussed, I know, right after that championship that uh, – it was really, really interesting to see on the semifinal night, you know, what happens to Oklahoma in real time. You know, we, all of a sudden, we, you know, we look down, we're sort of handling our other business at work, and the next thing you know, wait, 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 what happened I, to Oklahoma? I was, that was what me, happened? too, in, yeah. the, in the arena. Yeah, so I'm typing just, in the scores. LSU was in the first semifinal, and the top two make it to, to the finals. On, you know, on, this was on Thursday, and the top two make it to the finals on Saturday. So LSU's competed. We had the press conference. I'm typing in the scores from the semifinal. And there's three red teams competing in the semifinals, Utah, Alabama, and, and uh, Oklahoma. So it was a, if you're not really paying attention, you could kind of get distracted into thinking, forgetting who was on what event. And I, I see p- fans wearing red cheering somewhere. So I assume it's for Oklahoma. And finally I look up. And I see their scores a forty-eight something on 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 vault, and I ask the writer next to me, I said, "What happened?" Right. So forty-eight, they, forty-eight is not a good score. No, no anything under forty-nine, especially the national championships, is is bad. It's bad. <laughs> it's, it's, it's bad. And she's like, "They they felt they had two falls. They had three falls and counted two of them." And it's like. They were out. That doesn't happen to Oklahoma. The, the, the one thing you know about them is that they're not going to make mistakes. It was their worst vault score in sixteen years, something right. like that. They were undefeated all year. They never lost a meet right. all, all season long. Uh, and in the Big Twelve championships, they almost had a one ninety nine, which is totally unheard of. Yeah, a team score. That was, that was an all time record, wasn't it? Yes, one, yeah, it near, be, near yeah, one ninety nine, best score ever. And so uh, they they were out basically. So uh, Utah and Florida advanced to the final, and it's LSU's meet. Not necessarily they meet to lose because Florida and Utah especially were really good teams, but uh, but they had to perform in, in the in the clutch and they and they did and uh, you know that, that's the thing you can have the best team that's what a tournament's like and that's you, know, you you can we see it all the time in the NFL or, or in Major League Baseball and then we're gonna see it in the college football playoff probably not the best team doesn't always win and LSU was very close to being the best team but they were when it counted and that's that means a lot that yes, means a lot hey look it's the championship counts no matter how you slice it. Right. And they brought it home. And uh, Let's do like the Premier League where you just count the whole regular season <laughs> and that's it. You it's know. not nearly as fun. No. And that way we don't get to print up uh, advocate championship posters and have the athletes parade them all around there on the floor, which was obviously a thrill. But a shout out to the great Tanya Ramirez, incidentally, our night sports editor who's – the de- our designer extraordinaire who just and never, she never Michael misses. Johnson who is there oh, for distributing them. Who, I'm who, upstairs. Oh, well, by the way, and Michael who has never, who who always gets the shot too. He and Hillary Shinex. So God bless them and shout out. That to was them my second favorite out. moment of the year was him being with him photo- uh, photographing Maggie McNeil, the former LSU swimmer, uh, at the Natatorium in March and. And he, I, I hear the, I'm talking to the coach, and I hear the splash, and I, I look over, and, and Michael's in the pool <laughs> with, with a waterproof camera, getting pictures of Maggie uh, under 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 the water. And I was like, I thought he was going to put a GoPro in the water no, or something like that. But it's great. It's, he, it's great. They look great, and they're going to look great uh, when when the Olympic preview comes out this summer as well. Sheldon, 
highlight for the 23-24 season? You saw some <laughs> highlights and some pretty low lights too. <laughs> well, I have three highlights. Uh, one, uh, Jaden Daniels, um, you know, covering Joe Burrow and him in a, a five-year span. Pretty special. LSU hadn't had a Heisman Trophy winner in 60 years, and we got the pleasure of covering two in five years. So pretty that, was, special. that was pretty big, yeah. yeah. Now, not only him, obviously, but the receivers he had. You know, they didn't have quite the running back, obviously, that Joe Burrow had when uh, Clyde Edwards Elair, and that, that kind of took away from it a little bit. But still, it was a very exciting, fun team, fun offense to watch. Well, and not, I mean, just, you know, at the end of 2019, who among us, I mean, like, you know, you basically say, never in your life are you going to see an offense like that. These guys weren't 2019, but, boy, they were really, really, really close. And so, you know, you well, count your blessings if to, you're an LSU you know, fan. To go, to go back to that, I was at the Manning Academy in uh, last June, and I was specifically there to listen to and to interview Jaden mm -hmm. because we hadn't talked to him since the end of the season. So Jaden comes in and sits down 45 minutes. I sat there and listened and asked him questions. And at one point I asked him a question about I said, you know, does this offense, is it going to kind of be – and I didn't say it's going to be the same as 19, but, you know, can you do some of the things that they did in 19? And my, the point of my question was that Joe Burrow famously said at the same site – That's right. – that right. we're going to score 50, 60 points a game. And that was my point. It's kind of tongue-in-cheek. Well, a national writer from ESPN was there and wrote it that, you know, some reporter wanted to know if, uh, you know, if they're going to be as good as the 19 team. That's not that wasn't the point of my question. Right, right. He took it the way the wrong way. But anyway, Jaden answered the question. And I mean he's very e comfortable. He's very at ease with with the people that were around him. People would come, people would go, and I stayed there the whole time. Mm -hmm. And I mean, you could tell how this guy was just focused on what he had to do and, you know, started talking to him about the beginning of the season, you know, uh, getting revenge for that loss at you know, against Florida State and you know, it was it was all about the team, and you could tell that this guy it was on a mission, and and he and he, he wound up showing it. Just poised too. I mean, and that, that's what you saw on the field too. He just seemed like yep. he was never he was never troubled, never rattled, never you know nervous or out, out of uh, even, out of even the Florida State game. I think the stats wasn't terrible, and, and I mean he threw very few interceptions in two seasons. Right. Um, you know, the, the the year before he had he kind of had a bad game at Auburn. But they won the game. Mm -hmm. He had a terrible game against Tennessee, and people were down on him. And he just never, you know, he never gave up, never, you know, last year. He, he, it seemed like it kind of steeled his, you know, resolve to, you know, be a better quarterback and to have a better team playing, you know, playing with. Um, I guess my other two would be obviously seeing Jay Clark win a national championship. Because mm -hmm. I covered, like uh, Scott said, covered a lot of the national championships, including – D.D. Bro, who's one of my favorite coaches of all time that I've covered, mm -hmm. you know, watching her just get, you know, just like, you know, gutted every time they had a mistake. You could tell how much it meant to her to win a national championship. They and, had a lot and of she Oklahoma never moments did. in yes. the yeah. national semifinals. Yeah, yeah, where they themselves screwed yeah. up when right, they had a chance. Right. And, yeah. you know, you could tell how much it hurt her to not have that one thing and for LSU to finally do it. And have her there was kind of special, you know. Not kind of, it was special. It was very special. And sure. then my third thing would be, uh, you know, um, Matt McMahon and the basketball team going 9-9 nine and nine in the SEC. When a lot of people were still thinking, hey, this is a two-win team, you know, from the year before. They're going to be terrible. They're going to do this. They're going to be doing that. They're going to do this. They're going to do that. Matt McMahon has put the foundation in place. Not saying they're going to win 14 games next year. I'm not, not saying they're going to win 10 I'm saying that he's getting this program the way he wants it, and he had to build it from scratch. And it took him a whole year to kind of get comfortable. And, and I don't think comfortable may be the right word because he, he knows what he's doing. He knows what he wants to do. He just had, needed time to get it done. And I think last year was a big step forward, and I think they're going to do some good things again this year. He's got some really good players coming in. He is a developmental coach, and that's the big word he uses all the time. He wants to develop players. He doesn't want players that are going to come here. You know, now you're going to have a guy come in here, you know, on a transfer portal and may say, I'm, get, I'm leaving. Or he brings in a lot of seniors into the program from the transfer 
Jordan Wright, you know, st people like that. But he put it to you like this: he he is a he's not a quick fixer type of guy. He's a program builder. It That's seems to be exactly. a program builder who wants to win with a bunch of fourth and fifth year guys if he can if he can do it. If and that was his off. mo at Murray State because right. he, he had the smaller program. He was there for seven or eight years as assistant coach. And he was there for seven years as a head coach. So that was the only model he knew. Right. He wasn't getting these five stars in, into Murray State. Right. And and he and I think he's done a good job. I, I think he's going to keep building it. It's it's interesting. Uh, I I was because we're going to get to low lights here, or however you want to put it. And I was actually going to ask you if you had not brought it up, Sheldon, that you know it, it looked maybe about a third into the conference play that the men's basketball season was going to be a bona fide low light of the LSU sports season. But they did. That you know they 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 now give uh, a men's basketball fan uh, reason to believe that okay, yeah, you know this guy. This guy certainly deserves maybe a, a long runway, and there's no reason to start to panic and wonder if he's, you know, if you just, if you've hired a coach who's going to go perpetually four and fourteen in conference or something of like that. Well, effect. the reason why they, you know, they lost a couple of games in non-conference, including the one to Nichols, Oof. which was a big shocker. Oof. And you know, I saw some emotion that night from him. He pounded the, the, the table in front of him, which is unlike he, Matt McMahon. Which is unlike right. he's he's like a flat line. Guy, he's very mm -hmm. calm, uh, probably slow heartbeat, mm -hmm. and he got very. Uh, he was very upset that night, and he pounded the table, yep. which was kind of shocking to the people that were sitting there in front. Of him. I mean, I didn't know whether to kind of chuckle or I, I didn't know how serious he was, but he was serious. <laughs> and you know, the thing was, they lost that game, and then they lost the game in uh, Charleston at the Classic there, and then um, they lost to Kansas State here. So they lost some games in non-conference. Last year they went 12 and 1 in the non-conference games. So he lost oh he lost to Syracuse bad up in in, yeah. the, in the ACC uh, SEC challenge. So he lost some games this year. Then he won I think they went 3 and 0 to start conference. It was 2 and 0 for sure. Maybe 3 oh, and 1, I can't remember but Yeah, that sounds They right. played one of the hardest schedules you could play. It was almost like baseball. Yeah. Where Jay Johnson and that, that his group played the hardest teams in the first half of the SEC schedule. So when they got to you know uh, beginning of February, they started they started playing teams that were on par with them and below them, and they kind of got on a run and finished nine and nine. Right. I think they were four. I want to say they were three and six, maybe at the midway point, three and five, three it, and it six. Was, whatever it was, it was pretty yeah. ugly, and there yeah, was and pretty they ugly losses there too. the script in the second half right. of the season, and then you turn it around. You see, I mean, they they had that game in Gainesville. They could have won certainly, and some other ones that they they yeah. they were in the fight. Put it yeah. to you like that. And then in the SEC tournament, they didn't play the first night, which right. was a plus. Mm -hmm. They played the second night and played Mississippi State really close, and almost beat them after beating Mississippi State like five days early. I right. think it was so. right. Uh, speaking of, uh, we talk about low lights and highlights, even just within that men's basketball season of baseball. I, I was going to ask you, Rab, and I'll ask both of you two gentlemen. Low, I was, was going to say low lights. I mean, I think it's probably easy to say, well, okay, you know, the LSU foot, the defense on for the football team was awful, and you know, led to a lot of changes and cost them a lot of money to overturn the football, st the defensive staff, things of that nature. But um, maybe sort of a, a put a little turn on that, which is to say low lights and or wildest moments from the 23-24 season for LSU. I've got a couple in mind for wildest. <laughs> I, 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 do, I do too. Let's see if we, were, we're, we're, if we did not compare notes before the broadcast. So let me see if I, we were on the same page. Wildest, and, and, and to me it's kind of a low light, was all the controversy surrounding the women's basketball season. Just It was just one thing after another. Yes. Angel Reese uh, leaving the team and the Kateri Poole leaving the team. Uh, you know, didn't come back. Angel Reese came back after four games. And then you have the, this thing lingering over much of the season. There's this big Washington Post story out there. This is going to be this big expose. And we were here. What's it going to be like? What's in it? Kim Mulkey's hired this high profile media attorney uh, law firm or whatever. Uh, the story comes out. Remember the day we were going to the, uh, the story came out on the Washington Post we were website. In Albany, right? We were in Albany for the regional semifinal against UCLA. And, uh, I'm driving to the arena and Reed Darcy, our beat writer, is, is reading it on his phone. You know, just trying to, he's just getting through. I said, it's, "There's not a whole lot here." It was, um, a, it was a well written story, but again, we—I mean, I don't want to speak for you, Rab, but you know, who is Kim Mulkey? Well, we think that she's a brilliant coach, a great coach, but very, very driven, and not for everybody. And as as such, because she's so competitive, she can be 
downright mean and controlling and she's not and you know she's not for everybody right that's that's what we thought going into this story and that's what i thought coming out of the story it was it was not the bombshell that she was evidently fearing it might be so so that happens the game goes on and then she starts talking about this story in the la times <laughs> and we're like what is was this and it just so happens that at the arena the, a columnist from the orange county register which is in the la area that's one of their competitors was sitting to my right i'm like who is she talking to? She said, that guy with <laughs> this guy I'm calling him dirty debutantes and and uh and and also calling ucla sweethearts yeah. you know, america sweethearts just like kissing up to ucla and just totally Writing you know, things that should not be written about any anybody, quite honestly, in, in a newspaper, uh, you know, and uh, the guy eventually apologized, and they were they pulled part of the story, and then they 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 issued an apology and all this stuff, but it was just like one thing after another, and of course they get to the you know, they come up short of the of the national semifinal uh, of the of the final four with a regional final loss to Iowa and Caitlin Clark, but at that point it just felt like kind of exhausting, you know, right. a little bit, like right. the whole thing was just like. The, it was somewhat joyless compared to last you know, last season, when of course they won the national championship. But and there were a couple of bumps along the way in that season as well. But but this one just had one after another after another. It was a it was a wild ride. And you think in part of the way you're like a journalist, like hey, yeah, there's there's a lot to write about. There's a lot going on, and people are, re- are reading our coverage and everything. But at the same time, it's like, man, you know, okay, the Washington Post story. All right, that that was not a, a tempest in a teapot, and then you got this LA Times thing that was even worse. You know, it was like, man, it was unbelievable. <laughs> I'll, well, I'll go ahead, Sheldon. I I, I couldn't help but chuckle because, uh, as you guys know, I'm a staunch uh, Yankee fan uh, mm-hmm. for uh, many many years now, and uh, I can imagine it was probably close to covering George Steinbrenner in the back in his heyday. The seventy seven team where they're just gonna brawl and win the World Series at the same I think time. It's an app comparison. You just, yeah, yeah, you just didn't know what was gonna happen next. I'm sure those beat writers had some fun and so I imagine that's what it was sorta of like, um, probably on a much lower scale, but still it's, it's probably like, you know, covering George Steinbrenner, Bill and Martin and and uh, Bronx Zoo, uh, so what to speak. Reminds me, uh, speaking of brawling and winning all at the same time. How about the Thrilla in Green Villa? We, you know, we didn't even get to that. Where the <laughs> no, that's women right, that's right. And the South Carolina. Not, not for nothing. In, in a lot of ways, actually, that game in the PMAC, I understand LSU lost, but, man, that was a great basketball game that when LSU played South Carolina it, it was in a, the PMAC. It was, that it was, was a thrill a minute. Of course, Angel was. Reese fouled out with about three minutes to go, and I think South Carolina's debt probably you know, won, won the day, so to, so to speak. But, um, you know, I, I, weren't we all looking forward to seeing perhaps a rematch between LSU and South Carolina somewhere in the NCAA yeah. tournament? Because I, I do think, never say never, and LSU was so beat up and they were a little bit, you know, shorthanded on the bench and everything. But, I, man, might have got them that third time. They might have got them that third time. But that, that game was fun, too, the one in, in Greenville. You know, it, it ended a little bit ugly. And, of course, this leads to a debate of, oh, you know, hey, they shouldn't be fighting. Was, well, they're competitors. You know, sometimes you're going to come to blows. You know, there's every single, every, almost every hockey game is going to have a couple of, uh, <laughs> couple of uh, rough shots between, uh, between competitors, lively competitors. And that's part of the deal. You know, I, I, I don't take any offense to those who uh, might not be the wisest decision. But, hey, these things happen. Intentions and... Uh, you know, uh, tensions, you know, boil over, uh, uh, moods boil over and things of that nature. So uh, that was certainly a wild moment. I'm sure if we could, uh, if we go down the, if we get on the line, we could think about all the time, you know, the, I'm thinking about the baseball game, uh, LSU played at Alabama. I can't even remember what happened, but they basically had that game won. No, yeah, the series opener. Yeah. Yeah. Do you remember, I, I, all I remember is it's just like, geez, how do you lose that game? The I'm I'm trying to remember all the I details. Remember. Please, Go ahead. Yeah, please. I didn't see it at the time, but I remember they had two outs in the ninth inning, bottom of the ninth, and were leading by one run. And I, I don't remember if they had a runner on first or not, but the batter hit. I think uh, I think it was Griffin Herring and struck out the first two batters, maybe. Mm-hmm. Well, they, the guy hit a tapper right in front of the mound. Oh, I think it was Hayden oh, Travinsky yeah. came out firing. It was it was Malazzo because it was, it was Malazzo, your best defensive okay. catcher. Yeah, and he came out firing, and he uh, kind of went a little wild, and they got on base, and then they got another hit, and then. That's a game you that, win ninety nine times out of a hundred. That's the one. Just, that's the one because you that probably, was your best, your best defensive player who makes that play, and he and he air mails it to you, first. You know, you wind up. You don't. You don't. You know, it was bad at the time, but you kick yourself at the end of the season because that game, they would have swept Alabama. That game, did, did they win the second game? LSU win the second? Yeah, yeah they won the series. Yeah. 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 Is that 
Did they? At Alabama? Oh, I yeah. don't know. Alabama oh, might have won. No, they came back the next day and won, I think. Well, they won, a, they won at least one. Yeah. yeah. I, I should have yeah. brought my notes. They won but. the last game, I know for sure. But yeah. anyway, be that one way or the other, that was a, that was a you, win that you, you – I mean, they, at, des- they needed every win they could possibly right. get. So, and they desperately needed that, and they had that 99% won and blew it. So. so you look at that game, and you look at the Stony Brook game, and you look at the Southern game, sort of like yeah. LSU basketball with the Nichols game. They win those three games. They were hosting here last weekend. Right. They, they wouldn't have been on the right. road. So. And despite all of that, again, in, in some ways similar to the, the men's basketball season where it's just like, man, this thing looks hopelessly lost when they're 3-12 and 12 and con- when the baseball team is 3-12 and 12 to start conference play. And then here they, I understand that's not, you know, going to a regional and losing a regional on the road is not the standard at LSU, but by the same token, number one, surprised that they made it that far. If you, somebody would have told you that, you know, a month ago, that they were going to, you know, have a chance to be two outs away from going to the Super Regionals. And, by the way, playing the Super Regionals at home, mm. every LSU fan in the world would have taken that. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, so, that, so credit to them for making a run and not giving up. Credit to Jay Johnson for keeping that team together and not, you know, sort of checking out, for lack of a better way to put it, and uh, putting the run together. And, as it were, you know, they, look, they lost to Tennessee and North Carolina, who may, when it's all said and done, may wind up looking like the best two teams in the nation, certainly in the conversation for the Wouldn't best be two teams in the Wouldn't be a shock if they're in the final. Right, the lost to Tennessee Wednesday. in the SEC final, lost to North Carolina in, in the uh, in the Chapel Hill Regional final. Most by and one run. you were just that close to hosting West Virginia in the Supers, which means you're going to be a favorite, which means you're going to all of a sudden, one play here, one throw there, and next thing you know, you're in Omaha. Well, so, you know, Jay, Jay said after the game, he, you know, he thinks Tennessee and North Carolina are the best teams in the country, not because no, Tennessee, I agree. not because Tennessee swept them in Knoxville, and not because they lost to North Carolina. North Carolina's got a pretty good lineup, one to nine. That was they not, played great defense. Was, they had good pitching. They had a exactly. good a deep bullpen. Yeah, that, absolutely. That was not a uh, an easy task that LSU had to go into. I'm not trying to make excuses for them, but no, but it might have been it might have been the hardest region. Might have been, yeah. yeah. And, and and the win after they lost that second game on Friday uh, Saturday, to come back and win two on Sunday. They could have and it gave up five runs in the first game on Sunday mm-hmm. in the top of the first inning. You could have easily cashed it in and said, "Okay, let's go home, boys," and you know, and then almost to win it all. I mean, you, you gotta you gotta tip your hat to them. So uh, let's uh, before we wrap up this year, the the year frankly is not quite finished because uh, LSU, the LSU track teams uh, are in Eugene right now for the NCAA Nationals. Uh, Sheldon, we're halfway through right now as we as we come to you on Thursday afternoon. Uh, just give us the give us the Reader's Digest of where we are and whether the uh, the women in particular can can bring home the championship. Well, the women have been number one in the USTF CCCA computer generated rankings for seven of eight weeks in the indoor outdoor season, mm-hmm. and they have twenty two scoring opportunities at the national semifinals and finals. Put that in perspective for everybody: twenty two scoring twenty two scoring opportunities. So. The first two rounds, they call them the NCAA East preliminary rounds, which they were two weeks ago in Jacksonville. Um, I'm sorry, Lexington, Kentucky. And you have to advance through those first two rounds. The top 48 athletes in every event and the top 24 relay teams uh, get into the meet. This is based on your, your showings throughout the season. They get into the meet, and they do two rounds. If you get through the two rounds, top 12 in, the, in all instances – you get to the national semifinals. Mm-hmm. Well, the men's semifinals were Wednesday night in Eugene. Women's are Thursday night in Eugene. And you have to get in the top eight or nine, well, top nine in the sprints to get to the final. And the top eight teams, uh, eight finishers score points. So LSU had 22 opportunities, the women going into tonight, uh, go, going into tonight. Right. The men had 12 and they got five in last night, mm-hmm. three, three individuals, two relays. So they didn't do as well in the field. They had three field event guys that didn't, didn't score in finals. So they're, they're through. Um, so the men were uh, ranked fifth going into the meet. Their finals are Friday night. The women are competing Thursday night, and then whoever makes it gets through to Saturday. Saturday afternoon six or Saturday night is the finals for the women. Now, the women – you know, have a really good – 22 is a lot. Yes. Um, normally 15, 16 would be good. The thing mm. is Arkansas has 18. And Arkansas has, the last few years have won some national championships. So 
it's going to be probably close between LSU and Arkansas. But, you know, LSU's got a really, really good chance to, to pull it out and uh, win, win uh, their first NCAA outdoor since 2012, which was later stripped because of a, uh, <laughs> uh, uh, because of a, uh, a supplement that one of the athletes took. Um, yes, that's uh... – God, that's it's been a while, and I forgot about that. But 12, yes, it 12 years certainly was a case. Um, well, who are you, uh, Sheldon? Just for the for the you know for somebody who might only be checking in a track right now, who are you looking forward? Who sh- whom should the fans be looking forward to most? And just in terms of the thrill factor for LSU. Well, it's not a real thrilling event, but the 800 <laughs> meters. I mean, it's a two two lap race. Sure. It's not, you know, sure. it's not as, you know, it's not sexy as sexy as the 100, 100 yeah. or the 110, uh, 100 hurdles for women. Uh, but the 800 meters is Michaela Rose, who is only a junior. And she is one of only two, two U.S. women collegiates, collegians to ever go under 159 uh, in, in the two lap race. So she's a big favorite to go uh, to win uh, to pre, uh, not the prelims, semifinals are tonight. She'll likely be running in the final on Saturday. Other than that, LSU has, as as usual, and last year I don't think they had as many. They had some problems last year. They have three women in the 100 meters, four women in the 200 meters, and the, the big three in the 100 and 200 are Brianna Liston, uh, Thelma Davies, and Tima, God bless. Tima, mm-hmm. not Tina. Mm-hmm. Tima, God bless, who really came on strong at the NCAA preliminary rounds, uh, preliminary rounds, and those they they, gonna, they uh, threat to score in the 100, 200. They're all in the four by 100 relay, which is another good event for them. They have two uh, two young ladies in the 100 hurdles, two in the 400 hurdles. So they're set up pretty good uh, from. It's a lot of chances 100, to score points. 100, 200. They got a, a good entry in the 400. So they they 100, 200, 400, 800. 100 hurdles, 400 hurdles. They got lots of scoring opportunities there. So let me put, because, Sheldon, you've uh, been covering track for the LSU track for the Advocates since 1661. <laughs> um, you've they, seen so many of these great athletes come through, but it just with, particularly with respect to the 2024 Paris Olympics. And we don't know because, as we discussed many times, you know, you've got, you've got to get the job done at trials or you're not going. It doesn't matter how good you are. But let's just say that all the favorites make it through. Which LSU athlete are you looking f- forward to most uh, performing in Paris? Current team? No, it could be oh. you know, oh, LSU alumni. Any, uh, any absolutely. Of, I want yeah. to watch Mondo. I mean, it's, <laughs> it's just, fun, just yeah. fun to watch him. I mean, we've watched him at the you know, Olympic trials. Uh, a couple of years ago, we watched him at the Olympics, watched him at the World Championships the next right. year. He's won so many gold medals that he, he, you know, he's got more gold than Tommy White, and mm-hmm. you know, uh, a lot more gold than Tommy White. Good line, was, yeah, was, good line. But I'm, I'm not, I'm not knocking Tommy White at all. I wouldn't, I wouldn't mess with Tommy White. But um, you know, yeah, yeah, he's fun to watch, and he's going to be around for a long time unless injuries get to him. But I mean, he's he's 23 years old. He's got the world in his hands right now. Yeah, uh, we he could be competing at 28, 24, 28, 32. World maybe rec- 36 Olympics. World record holder at 23 years old. He's just going to continue to quite literally raise the bar just a little. I bit, think he's bit, broken the world record eight times. Eight yeah. times. Eight so, times. Which is just so, amazing. Which just amazing. And, Mondo Duplantis yeah. from Lafayette, Louisiana. Uh, you know, obviously had uh, the one year at LSU. I put, we're going to get to Shakiri. I pers- that that's my personal favorite. Uh, but I, we were talking. We've talked before about how you know you don't think about it, but once you do, it makes all the sense in the world. You can make a pretty strong argument that as a pole vaulter, you have to have the widest array of skills. Meaning, like you, your lower bodies, you got to have strong lower body. You got to have strong upper body. You got to have strong core. You've got to have great hand-eye coordination. You got to have balance. You got to have flexibility. You got to do all that stuff, all while you're speed. They, yeah, his you dad have some and his speed. brother Andreas said right. the speed. In, his speed so. is one of his greatest assets. Yeah. you know, I, I watched LSU's had a history of uh, good men's pole vaulters, mm-hmm. including Mondo's dad great and complaints. his brother yep. uh, Andreas. And the thing, the thing I've noticed, and in, in, heck, I don't, I don't even know Greg's in the top ten in the school history anymore, but. He was a very good vaulter in the early 80s. Mm. The thing I've noticed about vaulters at LSU, some of them 
get, and I don't know if this is just injury prone people or what, but a lot of them get bad backs. I don't, I don't know, I guess, because of bending. Think of and, all the twisting around. Yeah, twisting doing, you yeah. have to do. So uh, that's one thing you have to, you know, I'm not saying I hope, you know, I'm not saying it's going to happen, but you hope it doesn't to right. Mondo that he can, you know, go, go on and on and on, you know, health, pretty, you know, fairly healthy. And that we could watch him maybe the 36, the 36 Olympics. And, you know, you never, you never know. But, uh, yeah, LSU is going to have – usually has, you know, nine or ten athletes at the Olympics, uh, track athletes. So, it'll be another good group. And uh, I, I think uh, it'll be fun to watch them at the Olympics. And, you know, one of the funny things is we talked about, you know, uh, covering track for, you know, since 1979, I guess. And I liked it before that. I, I like – competitive races mm -hmm. i love to go to the horse race mm -hmm. horse races i love going to track but one one thing is in 2019 i had two freshmen yeah she carried richardson and mondo Duplantis. and i went out there before the ncaa meet and I, I set up interviews with both of them i sat down right there outside the weight room and i had both of them there i was in the middle she carries on one side mondo and you couldn't you couldn't have dreamed at that time that where they would be five years later. They'd be yeah. literally world I mean, class. I mean, the, yeah. the best I mean, of the best of the best of the best. Because Shakari had a really good freshman season. But when she went to the NCAA meet in Austin that year, she blew away Don Sowell's record that had right. stood for 40 years, right. maybe uh, 35, 33 right. years. Won the national, yeah. That was in Austin, right? Won the yeah. national championships in the 100. Yeah, she won the 100. Yeah. And that burst her on the scene. Next thing you know, she's turning pro. And LSU's not had a lot of that in track. Most no, of them not stay a lot around, of them, especially the, the sprinters. Most yeah. of them stay around three, four years. And then I, I want to say she went first, and then Mondo followed like a week later. Mm -hmm. But we knew Mondo was gone. Right. I mean, he, we, right. we already knew he was We were lucky class. to see him here one year right. in an LSU uniform right. Right. to watch him compete in an LSU uniform. And, uh, you know, the one thing I, I hate for the kid uh, – is that people always bring up the Sweden thing. Yeah. You know, uh, why isn't he competing for the USA? Well, there's a lot of factors go into it. But the easiest one is, you know, uh, money. Yeah. Uh, training in Sweden almost year-round. He doesn't have to go through trials. If he was competing for the U.S., he would have to go to the Olympic trials and get up there. And pole vault is a crazy event. You could snap well, a pole on your third event. I mean, your third attempt at a height. And you don't make the team. We, Look at we saw it. It was it was we saw it in '92, where the where the trials in uh, down in uh, Tad Gormley. That wasn't it was it was a decathlon. It wasn't yeah, a pole vault. Yeah. But uh, what was his name? Dan O'Brien. Dan O'Brien. Dan O'Brien, mm -hmm. who's never you know, made the team. He he should have been maybe the world's greatest athlete, which is what the decathlete you know the that's male right. decathlete always used to call. That was the year called. he missed out. That's right. yeah. It's a tricky event, but that's, that's, and, and that's and then you're not you're done. That's yeah. it. No more no no do overs. Yeah. No second chance. You're Sweet, done. Mondo Mondo. I interviewed him back in March when he was in town. He said. I think Sweden has one other pole vaulter. I mean, it's, it's not like a, <laughs> yeah, a, a, a squadron easier. of people but like also, you have it at the, but in every no. event of the U.S. Right, but to your point, though, Sheldon, if you if you're a pole vaulter, and I don't mean this in a disparaging in a disparaging way, but if you're a U.S. pole vaulter, even if you're a world record holder, gold medal winner, you're kind of just another guy yeah. on the USA Olymp on the U.S. Olympic team. You're earning power in Sweden. I'm sorry, not only on the circuit, you know, over there in Europe, but then as a sort of as a star, as a celebrity. You know, in the same way that Angel Reese is here in America or something like that. You know, Mondo is kind of a favorite son over well, there. And there's only so many great Swedish Olympic summer athletes, you know. And I, I told Scott this. He, you know, his grandparents live there, so he's he's close to his grandparents. Um, he's a rock star there. Yeah, uh, exactly. Todd Lane, Todd Lane, who's an assistant coach at LSU, told me, you know, why, why, did, you know, why would this guy want to compete in, you know, uh, anywhere else in Sweden? Because he's – I mean, it's not like – Hey, I, w I want to compete for Sweden. I'm, I'm going to become a Swedish citizen. There's ties there. Right. His mother's his mother, his mother and, and, yeah, and his grandparents are there. But he's a rock star there, and he can't go anywhere without people. You know, it's almost like the Beatles. And, and probably I'm exaggerating a little bit there, but that and the, and the fact that he can train there in a the Diamond League is there. Right. Almost all all summer long. Right. He doesn't have to keep going back and forth to there's the U.S. A, yeah, there's only one Diamond League meet in the United States. Every yeah, year. the Prefontaine right. meet. Right. And and you know so it it makes a lot of sense. I know people are disappointed, but I mean the guy wore LSU colors you know, right. for one year. And he's so, still a Lafayette guy. And yeah. Then, you know. Yeah. And there's nothing to be ashamed of. Yeah. And and you know he um, is very very polite. You know when you talk to him and stuff. Right. And, 
Uh, he's, he was raised the right way, obviously, and so so you you hope he does well, even if it is Sweden. But the, the, the final point I'm going to make about that is we talked about pole vaulters in the U.S. Scott asked me this a couple of months, well, a month ago, who was the last guy to beat him? And I probably couldn't find it, you know, think about it real quick. But in 2019, his only NCAA outdoor meet was in Austin, Texas, where Shakari uh, had her big breakout. Um, Mondo was competing against a guy named Chris Nielsen, or Nielsen, who was at the time, I think he was at North Dakota State or South Dakota State, and he's he's U.S.'s best uh, the U.S.'s best uh, hope for a medal. Mm-hmm. I think he he should be, but he's the last the last guy that I know beat Mondo in a competition. There you have it. And so Mondo didn't even win the NCAA. That's album. right. I'm pretty sure I he didn't win state. Didn't. I don't think he won state when he was at Lafayette High. Oh, I, I think, think was, I think he did. did. He? I think he set the okay. like, maybe uh, I'm misremembering that. Yeah, then. but he I think he was the only one to beat Mondo uh, at the NCAA level. How'd you like to be that guy? Hey, that guy holds the world <laughs> record. I beat him in college. Uh, and I, I remember talking to Mondo after the, the, you know, after he lost, and just as complimentary of Chris right, Nielsen right. as he could be. Well, speaking of which, that's listen. We all, we all have our favorites, right? And I like. I mean, I'm maybe I'm a sicko. I don't know, <laughs> uh, but you know, I loved my favorite. Two of my favorite athletes of all time were Paul Molitor, played for the Milwaukee Brewers, and Wayne Gretzky, obviously the you know the great one. And they were you know they always said all the right things and all that. But some of my other favorite athletes, Deion Sanders. Ricky Henderson, uh, <laughs> folks like that who are going to tell you about it and then do it and then tell you how about how bad how well they did it against you and say you know th- stuff like that. So, but so the only reason I bring that up is because of Shakari. Shakari will forever have my heart. First of all, for a couple of reasons. Remember Shel- Sheldon, both of you gentlemen being you know longtime track fans. You remember in '88, I personally the the memory that I have of '88, of course, is Ben Johnson and Carl Lewis. But let's not forget on the women's side. Flojo set the world record at the trials, 10-4-9 in Indianapolis. And Flojo always did it with a flair. She had the nails. She had the one long legging with the one short. You know, she had the hair going, and she looked like a model and the whole bit. I mean, Shakari to me, is Flojo. And where Shakari always, I mean, she had my heart anyway, and I'm, you know, I'm probably saying too much, but where she had my heart, frankly, was, you know, at her lowest point. She, she popped positive, you know, at the 21 Olympic trials. And guys, both of you, how many times, speaking of, you know, still a hero of mine, even though he shouldn't be, Ben Johnson, you know, guy's big as a house. He's got a whole pharmacy running through his veins. And immediately his camp said, well, I think somebody dropped something in his beer. You know, he had a couple of beers (laughs) post-race and they must have dropped something in his beer or somebody else pops positive. And oh, I had a bad sandwich. You know, I was eating tainted meat or something like that. Or it was my cold (laughs) medication. And I didn't know that. She carry got popped. She smoked marijuana, and she said, "Yeah, I, I did it. You know, I did it. I was trying to cope with a, a with a loss in the family, a death in the family, and I did it. And I shouldn't have done it." She then got beat, you know, a couple of, in a couple of professional races after that, and immediately post race, she said, "Yes, they beat me on this day. It was not as good. I'm going to come back, and we'd be better." And don't we all love a comeback story in the United States, incidentally? And so here she is. Now she's a world champion. She wins the 100 meters at Worlds. And, she, and you know, like I say, don't we love in Louisiana somebody who does it with a flair? She's going to tell you about it. She's going to be loud. She's going to be brash. She's going to run out there with freaking orange hair or blue hair or whatever it is she's got going on that day. And, I, I, I man, I love her. I hope I hope she does great. I hope she beats Shelly Ann Fraser Price and all the other, you know, the great Jamaican stars and the other U.S. competitors and just – I'm – I, wherever I am on that night, I will be looking with eyes completely glued to that thing from start to finish. I can't wait to see it. Well, as Mondo is a huge favorite to, to win the pole, I can't. There's probably not going to be a more prohibitive favorite in Paris. Yes. In any event, than, than Mondo de Plantis, other than like the U.S. women's basketball team or right. the gymnastics team. Well, maybe Simone Biles, even more than Simone Biles, because of what well, happened I, is Simone she, in Tokyo. If she wins, she will be the star of the Olympics. She I'm will, but you, right I, now. I don't think she goes in as you no. know, like everybody. Is no. She, are we sure, she's going to win everything. Right. Uh, you know what's going to happen? No, she's not a lock to win. Either. No, she's, she'll be uh, a favorite. But Shikari is in a in she you know her her signature event is the hundred meter dash. That's where she was a world champion, and that is a tough field. Yeah. I, I mean, just Sheldon could tell you. Better than better than I. That you know, it's, it's it's she's one of the best of the world, no question. But we're talking fractions of a well, second. And as Carl Lewis himself used to say, you false start. If you have a, if you get off to a bad start in the hundred meters, you've got a hundred meters to be pissed because there's nothing you can do about <laughs> it. The margin of error is just so thin. And as we just, as we say, going back to the Olympic trials, you know, if you wake up with the flu that day and it's your day to compete, 
sorry, I'm sorry, kid, you're not going to the Olympics. That's just the way it is. Same as once you once you get there, even if you make make it through all the heats or something, you, you know, you yeah. stumble or whatever yeah. it is. I mean, we saw it, God bless her. We saw it with with uh, with Lolo, you know, in the final yeah. hurdle. Where's the second to last hurdle? Second to last. Second yeah. to last. I mean, but, had the gold medal in her hand. Mm-hmm. So anyway. you know, you know, the same the same thing goes. You know, last year at the World Championships. You know, I don't think anybody gave Shakari any chance. I mean, she's she's a little flaky. You mm-hmm. know, I don't think anybody uh, gave her a chance to win that gold medal. The, the three Jamaicans, yeah, Shelly course. and Frazier Price, uh, Sharika Jackson, like the last one. They Sharika escaped. was the one I was thinking. Yeah. I was trying to think of. I mean, they were prohibitive favorites to win, yeah. and she just beat them. And she beat and, him. She beat him coming from behind too. She just and, kept accelerating, accelerating, caught him on the last ten yards. And you know, it, it seems like I've I've only I, I don't know how many races she's w- run this year. I know she ran at that pre Fontaine meet, mm-hmm. but she looks like she's toned it down a little bit. Her hair is dark. It's not right. green or well, I think, orange. I mean, look, <laughs> don't we all want to? In all seriousness, don't we? Want, I, I mean, she's grown up. It, I, I think, to say, I the think mature, she's grown up. The maturing up. process. I mean, we might be seeing it right in front of our eyes. And God bless her. You know, good for her. Um, she she probably realized that hey you know something's got to change yeah and, you know it. last year was maybe just the, we just saw the tip of the iceberg last year at the world championship that's right every setback is a setup for a comeback or it yep. certainly certainly it can be uh, one more thing before I get throw this wild card at you guys uh, because it's a, it was a, it was a topic that I wanted to bring up this summer when things were going to get a little a little slow and we were going to need something to debate but now that I'm on my way out I'm going to bring it up now. <laughs> uh, Rab, you wanted to mention uh, about Haley Van Lith, former LSU, uh, mm-hmm. former LSU great, so to say, uh, yes. who's got, also going to be in the Paris Olympics. Yes, uh, yesterday they named the team for the uh, three-on-three basketball. People are like, what's three-on-three basketball? Well, it's a half-court version of the game. <laughs> it's exactly what it sounds three like. Three players <laughs> on each side, and they play on an outdoor court. And, uh, and so uh, only four players on a team. So, you know, you don't have a lot of a lot of chances to make the team. And she was on the World Cup team that won in Vienna last year for the U.S., won the gold medal. So, so you figured she had a shot. Cameron Brink? Cameron Brink. Yeah, okay. uh, and so it's, uh, it's those, those two on the team again, the Sierra Burdick and uh, Lenore uh, uh, Ryan. Is it not Lenore? I don't know. Uh, Lenore, Ryan, Ryan Howard. Ryan yeah, Howard, Howard excuse say, me. Lenore Ryan. Lenore, Lenore, Ryan, Lenore, 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 Lenore was a North university. Yeah. I, knew, I knew there was a Ryan Lenore in this. Lenore Ryan. I, I got a lot of – I've been doing this for 35 years, as we said, folks. I've got a lot of names rolling around in my head. But Ryan Howard, yes, they are the team. And if you go on social media, there's a video of them uh, telling Haley Van Lith she's been selected, and she just breaks down. You know, It's nice to see an athlete. It's just, it's just, it means something to it's just, it. yeah. yeah, it's not about the money. It's not about the NIL deal. It's not about the endorsement deal. It's just about making the Olympics and representing your country. And I know people, some people were like, oh, she's gone from LSU. She left LSU, uh, you know, but I don't know. I think and she frankly struggled at LSU. And she, and, and she did. Yeah, it wasn't, it was, you could say it's a failed experiment. Right. I, I think it's a little harsh, but it, it, you know, she, uh, she came here to try to be the point guard and it didn't quite work out. But I had Victor Howell tell me her her, her towns are well suited to the three on three game and and she, I think they got a great shot yeah. to to win a gold medal in Paris and it will say one other thing about that they're competing outdoors I said I asked her I said uh, do you know where you're going to compete I said she said some arena I guess no I said the Place de la Concorde that's where they uh, beheaded Marie Antoinette <laughs> this did is she, big did public did she, she didn't know that oh okay yeah. all right well, <laughs> she's never been to Paris let so her so. have cake let her have cake and <laughs> a gold medal I hope the court's not red <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean that's crazy. It's stained. It's stained, yeah. It's going to be where all the urban sports are. They're going to have BMX. They're going to have braking. Break, break and, dancing. And they're going to have, uh, they're going to have uh, skateboarding is and, and three-on-three three basketball. Did Butch Muir enter the break dancing? I, I think, he is, I think okay. he is going to be there as a judge. Butch, we'll look forward to it. Oh, no, man. He's got to come out of retirement. Come Butch, of retirement. we love you. We miss you. Um, uh, so the one last thing I, I did want to bring up, uh, and it, unless we uh, need to tie up any of the greatest hits that we missed, was uh, we were going to bring this up, obviously, during the summer when things kind of get slow and you start turning toward college football. But I always thought a great topic uh, when things are going to start to get slow uh, is um, what's the – if we're talking about college football, all things are equal. We're going to start at zero. Um, you know, Forget about last year's roster, this year's roster, who's coaching the team now, and so on. What is the what is the most attractive, or what is the best? What should be the best program to college football? In other words, if 133 jobs are open, all 133 FBS college football programs have an open position for head coach, and you don't know anything about the rosters, who's coming back, and all that, what should be the most attractive program in the United States? Rab, I'll put it to you. 
Well, I'm going to say a name that probably a lot of people don't want me to say, and the LSU is going to open the season against them. I would say USC. Okay, go ahead. I, I've got some thoughts on that, and uh, I, would, I maybe would have said they that. They have tremendous tradition. They've had lots of Heisman Trophy winners. They've won lots of national championships. You're, you're in a, a huge population center where you uh, where there's just tons of talent in California and on the West Coast, obviously, and you can uh, – you, you know, you can just you can stay in your backyard and and, and put together a great team, and I don't under uh, and it's a very good school. You know, mm-hmm. you, you, if you got someone who's like, you know, uh, you know, starting to think players choose schools for ac- academics, but if they do, yeah, they 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 got just about anybody beat. So I, I'm like, I'm always puzzled when USC doesn't do well. Quite well, they honestly, they seem to go, and I, I would have said that's certainly in the running. That certainly mm-hmm. would have been in the running for my choice. Um, I, now are their facilities and the money well, quite that, as good? It seems like they go uh, through cycles know. where they yeah. decide they want to get real serious about this, and, and and when they do get serious, they can outspend almost anybody. And their alumni get the obviously you've got plenty of you know rich folks who are heads of studios or you know heads of Fortune 500s out there and all that. And if they decide they want to throw money at the problem, they can throw money at the problem. But then you have these weird periods. You know they kept on they hired Pat Hayden as their AD, and he had no experience. Lynn Swan and. You know, they just they were high, you know right. interested in hiring USC men or whatever, and that was it looked like it was just sort of a sloppily run athletic department or whatever. And you know, Clay Helton, it sure seems for everything like you could if you're USC, you could have done better than Clay Helton. And then you and yeah. then you you know before that you fire Lane Kiffin on the tarmac and all that. Of course, he's <laughs> matured a little a little bit, not a lot, but a little bit over the years. So so uh, I think that's in the running, and I, I I'm not so sure I would have said it four or five years ago when they were still in the Pac-12. And they didn't seem to have their act together, but certainly they're going to the Big Ten, which means they're going to have all the money they could ever hope for in terms of distribution from the league. Mm-hmm. And so, yeah, no, if they if they've got everything together, that's certainly that's certainly a, that's certainly a good vote to for, to cast. Um, Sheldon, you got a you got a thought? Well, uh, I would think. Uh, uh, I'm a, I'm a Nebraska fan a little bit. Um, mm. Got some. Uh, my dad was born in Omaha, so I didn't know that. I've always like I've always liked Nebraska a little bit. And uh, you kind of look. Yeah, you know, they've been down. You know, you had obviously the year, the good years, and they've been down a little bit and never could find the right fit. I mean, Mike Riley is a really really nice guy. He went from Oregon State to there. wasn't a fit. You covered him when Mike Riley was with the Saints. With the Saints, yep. yeah. Good, really good guy. Uh, really uh, easily accessible. Um, but but then you know they they made some funny funny hires, and then now they got Matt Rule, mm-hmm. who uh, you know it seems like he's got them going in the right direction. Maybe they kind of come back a little bit because it, I mean they were right up there in the nineties. They were one of the one of the blue oh, bloods the of program. the one, program won three out of four yeah. titles. Yeah. So nice. uh, to me, that that's an interesting one to watch. And since, since they went to the Big Ten, it's kind of doesn't have that same feel. Right. Uh, they you know they didn't play Oklahoma for a while, and, you know, so it wasn't kind of the same feel when they went to the Big Ten. I, I wouldn't. The reason I would I would put that sort of on the second tier, I guess, for lack of a better way to put it, would be because of their recruiting base. You know, Nebraska obviously is not the most fertile. And they, for the longest time, what did they do? I guess they went to California a lot of times to get their skill guys. And then when they were in the Big 12, they had a, a fair amount of success going into Texas as Texas. well and, and getting guys there. And, I, of course, we all know that they were at the very, very, very front of the line when it came to a strength and conditioning program. You know, they, they were way out in walk front. Walk-ons. Were, walk they on, made walk-ons walk famous. Ons, yeah. Not the restaurant. They made the <laughs> way walk-ons. Before the real walk-ons made them, um, made them a, a household name. Right. Almost. But, they, I mean, now, in terms of level of support, I mean, they've been kind of lost in the wilderness for almost 20 years now, and they still have yet to fail to sell out that football stadium. Yep. So that tells you everything you need to know about support. You're the they big, sold out for a volleyball game. Yeah, the, yeah that's right. I mean, if they, if they, you know, a lot like LSU in the sense that if there's a program, oh, look at that, the gymnastics program is a top five pro. Okay, well, let's go sell out the arena. You yep. know, it's not quite, it's apples and oranges a little bit, but not a lot. Uh, the support's going to be there, and, you know, Omaha's fairly large. You've got some people with some money there. I don't know how many Fortune 500s there are in, in, in the state of Nebraska, but uh, it's got mutual, potential. Mu- mutual mutual of Omaha. Omaha. And, of course, Warren Buffett. <laughs> That's an easy one. Yeah. Um, the, but uh, uh, Dorley Zoo or what? <laughs> <laughs> Omaha Stakes. I don't think they're Fortune 500. Omaha Stakes. Uh, but, no, I, you know, that, that's, it's interesting. It'll be interesting, too. You know, now, of course, the Big Ten's about to get richer. Uh, more money coming coming there. If they if they 
I, I'm curious to see what Matt Rule does because one of the things, one of the ways he, he got turned around Baylor, you know, I think they started yep. either 0 and 11 or 1 and 10 his first well, year. He he had to clean up the mess that was he had left to clean up in, the mess from the uh, art browse. That was and that was as big a mess as there could be. But he also he placed an emphasis. I remember this because the Big 12 was sort of you know started to turn into basketball on grass. He placed a big emphasis on a line of scrimmage. We're, we're going to make sure that we went at the line of scrimmage. And I'm, it paid off. He wound I, up winning the Big 12. I'm going to tell you something about him. He was almost like in – I don't want to say it's the same. I'm not comparing him to Nick Saban, but he went and tried the pros. Maybe he didn't like it. I mean, I know yeah. he got canned. Nick walked away. He he got canned, and he went back to college, which you know, I think says a lot about him that, hey, I, I tried, dipped my toe in it, maybe didn't like it. Now he was with a – Bad situation in Carolina. He was. And the other thing, too, to remember is that, you know, he, he made Temple into a winner. Temple yep. is a freaking, you know, barren wasteland, if ever there was one, <laughs> yep. in terms of a college football program. And then he took Baylor. You know, Baylor, obviously, the support is there now and has been for the last 15 or so years. But he took over a disaster of a program and turned that into a winner. Now, you don't – the the difference between, uh, you know – the Nebraska has not been what Nebraska used to be, but they're not. They're also not a rock bottom. Right. They're not. They know they're not coming off a one and ten season or one and eleven season or something like that. So be, I, I, I will be intrigued to, to watch Nebraska. Let me let I me would, guess what yours is. Okay, go ahead. Oklahoma or Texas? I I thought really really hard about Texas. I thought about Oklahoma. I, I thought about te- Oklahoma. You can make a strong case for too, especially now that they're going to move into the SEC and they will be the only SEC team in that state making SEC money. The the one thing that I'll say excuse me, is that A&M, Texas, and Oklahoma now are all going to be fighting for the same recruits. Mm-hmm. And now I still I still kind of think um, Longhorn Network's going away and Texas is going to have to get used to not being able to run the show, so to speak, because they did, you know, they got a disproportionate amount of money in the Big 12. They got the Longhorn Network and all that, and they were used to sort of, uh, they were listened to very carefully at the league office. And they're going to go to the SEC, and that might be something of an awakening for them. No, you're not running. You know, you can't just make a phone call to <laughs> Birmingham and get it your way. It's not how it rolls in the SEC. Um, Do they know where Birmingham is? Yeah, they're going to have to find out real fast, aren't they? <laughs> they might not make it to Birmingham for a long no, time. No, I thought I'd say in Texas as well as being like because they have all the money in the world. Obviously, sitting a great talent base. They have the facilities. They just built a new basketball arena that LSU is, is has looked at to, to to build their to build their arena. Uh, to model theirs after, but Texas and Texas A and M always seem to kind of, as I've said this before, run with their shoes tied together. Yeah. Sometimes it's like you should be. Yeah, like, well, Texas, Texas has had more success. I mean, the most success in Texas A and M, but not as much as USC. A and M hasn't won a national championship since Hitler, Hitler invaded Poland, nineteen thirty nine. Yeah, so <laughs> yeah. it's been a while. And okay. maybe the SEC championship game. Right. Uh, Texas <laughs> is is coming to a very competitive situation, and 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 to 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 the earlier point about them all going after the same recruits. It, it seems hard traditionally, maybe this won't be the case, for Texas and Texas A and M to be very good at the same at the same time. So mm-hmm. we'll we'll see. They're coming into the more competitive situation. Um, but uh but you know you seem like Texas I think is I think is honestly underachieved uh, oh, they uh, have. traditionally sure than, than what they what they could do. Interesting. I I, I don't know that there is a there is one right answer, like there's one definitive answer that stands above all else. But I, I thought a lot about Texas and I thought a lot about Florida. And it pains me to say that because I'm not a, not a <laughs> Gators personally. Um, not that it matters anymore, but I, I, my brother and I, we grew up in Florida when I was little. And my brother and I were big Florida State fans because he used to go to the Bobby Bowden football camp. And so he sort of became, a, even though he didn't go there, he, you know, we both became fans of the program. And so uh, clearly if you're taking that position, you're not necessarily a, a big fan of what happens in Gainesville. But uh, if you think about Florida, obviously a tremendously fertile recruiting base. And, yes, they're one of three. There's the big three in the state of Florida, and UCF is trying to pound their way in to becoming, making it a big four. Uh, but I still think – Making some progress. Yeah, and they are making progress. That's right. They're in the Big 12 now, and so you know, they, they can, they're part of the Power Four conference uh, structure. But Florida is the only one in the SEC – at least for now, uh, Florida is the only one in the SEC, which means you're going to have that much more money. And Florida, you know, Florida as an institution with the alumni has a ton of money too. So the fact that you're the the big dog in the SEC in that state, I think, is, 
Uh, now, of course, as soon as I say that, now I go back and I start thinking about Texas. Well, they're going to be in the SEC, too. So uh, it'll be interesting to see how well, as we go down the road, incidentally, how well those two programs do, uh, given the fact that they should have every advantage, you know, in terms of resources and recruiting and uh, fan base and alumni and all that stuff. Yeah, Florida's so. just had back-to-back non-winning seasons since the for the first right. time since 40s. the 40s. late 40s. And, and that's why I set it up they as not, if they, all things they are not equal. Happen. That's right. They, if they all things are equal, bad. they should not be that bad. If, if we're starting from zero and you just say, you can, you know, you're know, you going to have to build your own roster no matter where you go, where do you want to go? To me, it would seem like Florida or Texas. But USC, that's a, that's a strong... I, I, will, I, can, I can listen to that argument because I may, think it makes a lot of sense, particularly with respect to them going into the Big Ten and getting that Big Ten money. So it's just a fun thing to think about. I don't, I don't know who else. You can make a case, I guess, maybe for Penn State, Ohio State. Certainly well, Ohio, Ohio State. State Ohio you know, State's they've got all the money in the world and they're kind of, they're Michigan's national championship notwithstanding. They're, they should, should always be in really, really good Ohio shape. So. And Ohio State this year is going to be preseason number one or two, I would imagine, should be. them or Georgia. Yeah, they should be. But and we didn't mention Georgia either. You know. we didn't mention, well, and Georgia's always going to have what's, – what's interesting about Georgia as we continue to go down the road, not just given the success they've – the recent success they've had, but the fact that Atlanta is just going to keep growing and growing and growing and growing. You have a bigger city. You ha- you're in a spot that loves football, you're going to have – more kids playing football, which means that recruiting field is going to get more and more, should get more and more fertile, and that's your backyard. You, you're the you're the only SEC team in that state, so you can yeah, presumably George, have the Georgia pick of the Tech's not quite the threat. <laughs> no, <laughs> not not lately. Unless Bobby Ross or uh, uh, Bobby Dodd come Bobby Dodd that door. Right, yeah. Bobby Ross won a national championship there. Yeah. Uh, obviously, this is an LSU podcast. People are saying, "Why aren't you pushing LSU?" LSU is a school that I think we could all say is punched above its weight class. For, for you Listen, know, you can make a the case. but but there but there are a lot of things commending LSU, especially in football, and that that is a fertile state for recruiting. You're the only SEC, you're the only really power team. Yeah, it, Tulane's done some very good things lately, but it's not, and they could make the playoff, you know, potentially yeah, as, but, as one of those teams. Power four is power four. Power four is power four, and and that, that's not changing. And uh, and they've got the facilities, they've got the money. Uh, you know, there's talk about you know p- schools dipping into private equity. I don't see LSU doing that you know, to private fund their capital. There private is a capital, difference excuse between, me, yeah. to, to to fund their uh, athletic program. I don't see, see them doing that. So um, it's uh, you know I, th- I think LSU's positioned pretty pretty well. They're right there. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I was when I put forth this question. Yes, you could have said LSU, but I was sort of assuming that we were that none of us was going to say LSU. Right. But li- hey, look, <laughs> national recent national championship in football. Recent national championship in baseball, recent national championship in women's basketball, recent national championship in women's gymnastics, potential national championship. Or they just had a men's championship in track, and so I was thinking, hey, I was look, thinking you could have a, you could have a third women's national championship at LSU in fifteen months. Come Friday night, uh, Saturday night. Is that maybe. right? Yeah, that's right. In yeah. fifteen months. Yeah, and the women's golf team. Got to what quarterfinals or semis? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. They reached match play. Yeah. Match play. The well, they win the, yeah. yeah. So they were close. Yeah. You know. And I think it's commendable. I, I think it is important. Again, you two, you two old heads can appreciate this. Maybe you know more than our than our younger viewers and our younger reporters. It's it's amazing that LSU finds itself in this spot. It took a lot of work, and it's to the credit of everybody who's worked there, from Skip Bertman on, um, and everybody underneath him, uh, all the way up through Scott Woodward. But it's amazing when you think 25 years ago, LSU really was a program, it was a sleeping giant that had not accomplished much, that frankly tried to kind of do stuff on the cheap. And now it's, we're going to, you know, how many times has Scott Woodward said we're going to invest in human capital? The facilities are top notch. The, they're they're, they're going to spare no dollars when it comes to hiring staff and things, you know, staff, building a nutrition center and, uh, you know, weights, all that, everything is there for them. To be able to win it, and the, the one thing I'm I'm concerned about LSU, and I've said we've said this before, as we move down the road with this, you know, NIL and revenue sharing and, and stuff like that, is that you know the concern is that hey, we only have two Fortune 500s in the state, you only have, you've got a bunch of millionaires, but Texas and Florida have billionaires, mm-hmm. and at some point you do, I have, to, I I would worry if I were LSU that at some point you just run out of millions because these guys, these other guys, just keep spending and spending and spending, but. I, we're gonna have to watch. We're gonna have to watch that as it go down, goes down the road. Maybe they'll maybe they'll still continue to be a, the juggernaut that they are. 
Yes. <laughs> no, it's, it's, it's a fascinating story. To, and no one knows the answer. That's no, right. No, no one exactly knows the answer, but, but LSU is competitive. Right. Uh, where some other schools you could point to, like, eh, can Arkansas be as competitive? Uh, you know, I, I don't, like Ole Miss. You know, I mean, Ole Miss Ole, is never going to get they there. They won a national championship in baseball, but I mean, but God never, bless them, but yeah. that's just they're not, never going to win a football. Yeah. Uh, and look, mentioning those schools. There are a lot of people who say college football is going to eventually wind up with some kind of NFL-like model, just in college football. You know, I don't think the NCAA is going to completely go away for all the other sports. No. And, and it's going to be 30, 40, 50, 60 teams, and all those power four schools are not going to be in that number. Right. And if I was Ole Miss or Mississippi State or, or, or Kentucky, I'd, I'd be concerned. Kentucky, LSU, you probably, I don't think you probably sneak your way in, about. you know, because— In football? Because of, yeah, Sure. Uh, Kentucky is one of those programs. I, was, I don't know. Okay, but listen, I'm telling you, if, they, if Kentucky ever gets, and, and God bless Mark Stoops, he's done more than anybody could ever hope to. But Kentucky always struck me as one of those where if you got just the right coach, the next Nick Saban or whoever it is, you're close enough well, to. Well, they did have Bear Bryant at one time. They did, and, <laughs> and that, that was a, what was it like? They gave Adolph Rupp a Cadillac or something, and they get you know at the at the awards banquet, you know, and then they gave. Uh, they gave Bear Bryant like a new hat or something. <laughs> like I'm not joking. I go back and look that up. He said, "Man, the hell with this. I gotta get, I gotta get someplace that takes takes football seriously." But if you ever you're right next to Ohio, you know, state of Ohio, mm-hmm. you're close enough to like Nashville and places like that that are growing. I, th- I always thought that. I'm not saying that I think that they're gonna end up as a top five powerhouse or whatever. But th- I think there's there's always been if they ever really really go all the way in on it, there's potential there. But you gotta have just the right coach. Uh-huh. Anyway. You, you uh, think I'm being too I don't, I don't, see, I don't okay. see it. All right. Well, I, I, and look, but, but I, look here's, but, I mean, to your point, I think Kentucky's got a better shot at going in. Like, I'm real sorry, Wake Forest. I'm real sorry, yeah. Boston College. Like those those guys. Okay. Uh, you know, enough. like I'm, you're gone. But, I'm but sorry. Scott's Scott's the expert on here. Uh, how many teams in the SEC, counting Oklahoma and Texas now, can win a national football championship? Half. Te- you got, you got Texas, teams? Oklahoma. Texas, Oklahoma. Even though Texas is kind of. Texas A&M, can, Texas A&M can, can, LSU, 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 Bama, Auburn, Bama, Tennessee, Florida, Florida, Georgia. Yep. Yeah, I guess that's probably it. I mean, so there's a lot. There's yeah. a lot there. So that's eight. You can't say that about so every conference in the country. Right. Oh, no. No, you can't. You certainly can't say that about the Big Ten. I'm sorry. Well, the Big Ten. Uh, let's see. Washington, USC, Oregon, oh. maybe, I guess you have Oregon. to say, because they've been there. I've been close. Um, Ohio State, Michigan, Penn mm. State. Are we forgetting anybody else? Mm, maybe Nebraska. Mich- maybe Michigan State. Maybe they, Michigan, they've Michigan been in the State. Playoff. I don't know. Michigan State. Yeah. Maybe, Nebraska maybe Nebraska probably Nebraska just because of history. They've done so they've, they've done it. They they're, in the the middle, they're in the middle so of the pack. Yeah. Seven, maybe? Yeah. Michigan so. State made the four-team playoff. But right? I, I don't right. ever see Kentucky, Arkansas, Ole Miss, Mississippi State. South it would, Carolina. South Carolina. It would shock you, me. You just, you'd have to at Arkansas and Kentucky in particular. Certainly not Vanderbilt. <laughs> no. <laughs> but it would shock me if any of those teams would ever get, I mean, maybe even in a 12-team playoff. Yeah. So what you're saying, yeah. you could see Kentucky in the 12-team playoff one day. They I'm put not it all saying, together. I'm not saying I think it's going to happen. I'm saying they if can. just the right guy came or along, 14 they, could do, it. Yeah. <laughs> they could do it. Yeah. They could do it. Yeah, Kentucky could, go, you know, what, what was it? Was it 19 where they had a real good year? 2000 when they had uh, Josh Allen, the pass rusher, and who was the quarterback? I'm blanking now. At well, they haven't rate, made they had, it to a, 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 a CFP, a New Year's Six Bowl yet. Right, but, I mean, would it be the craziest thing the if one year game. Kentucky finished number 12 in the nation? I, I think if, if everything yeah. happened right, they could that do could it. Happen. They could happen. do it. But they even to get in the, the SEC playoff. championship game, I just don't see it. No, I don't either. They've, they've never been in the SEC nope. championship game, have no. they? The only ones are Kentucky. Kentucky, Kentucky Vandy, Vanderbilt, uh, Ole, Miss. Ole Miss, and, and A&M. Uh, uh, That's right, because South Carolina made it. Kentucky, Vanderbilt, A&M, and Ole Miss, that's the only four? Yeah. All right, we're probably going way too long <laughs> on this, uh, but uh, I appreciate you guys. I appreciate you guys coming in, uh, and I mean this when I say it. It's been an honor to have to to be. It's been a thrill of mine, a personal thrill of mine, it really has been, and kind of a dream come true to to be able to say to be able to work at the Advocate, to be in the lead chair at the Advocate. Um, you know, this town is where I went to high school. It's where I met my wife. We got married. Had our had our two daughters here. All that. Um, uh, but to be able to say that I'm you guys, that I've been you guys as supervisor, it's been a cute little thrill for me. A guy, two guys who I used to, you know, grow up reading uh, in the paper every morning. So uh, I do appreciate you guys coming on. Thank also you. appreciate you guys always having, always having gone the extra mile 
Um, you know, when you, when it would have been easier to just say, look, I, I got to tap out. Um, so I appreciate you guys. I appreciate everybody who's, who's come through here in the last five to 15 years, uh, in any kind of capacity I've been in. So, um, and I'll, I'll just say that, um, um, appreciate where you are, uh, wherever you are right now, whatever you're doing, be grateful. I'm certainly grateful that I had 15 years here. Uh, it's been the thrill and an honor of a lifetime. Uh, and we just got some, some news about somebody, uh, who we know who we're very close to, who we're all thinking about, um, that, uh, will serve as a good reminder to, uh, to tell your people you love them and to tell the people in your life professionally and personally, uh, how much they mean to you and, uh, how much, uh, how much impact they have on your life. And that's important. So, uh, I apologize for getting a little poignant on the way out, but, uh, I did want to say that. And I say, um, uh, just that it's been, it's been an honor that, uh, that, uh, little punk kid from McKinley, uh, could come <laughs> sit in this chair and lead this, uh, lead this motley crew of folks. Um, it's the best sports department in the United States. I'm sorry. Um, I'm biased. I know that, but, uh, they've proven it day in and day out and we've, uh, we've proven it on a national level. So thank you. Bye. Thank you guys both for being who you are and, and for allowing me to be your boss and, um, and for, uh, allowing me to have a great job and for making the job great. Yeah, I'm going to miss those phone calls uh, that I get from Perrin once in a while and say, could you do something for me? <laughs> sure. How what, much do you love me? <laughs> that's, usually my, that's usually my question. I know that. Yeah. So, but yes, no. Thank you, guys. So, uh, Thank you. Thank you, Brad. Um, I'll, I'll just uh, I'll say I'm, uh, I'm going to walk out the doors. The Advocate's biggest fan. I'm still going to say sub stay subscribed and keep up to date with everything. Uh, and you guys should, too. Go to theadvocate.com slash subscribe to subscribe today, whether that's in print or digital. We take pride in both, of course. Uh, and stay up to date with everything LSU-related on uh, the LSU newsletter. You can find that at theadvocate.com slash LSU newsletter. Uh, whoever will be in this chair replacing me uh, will be with this uh, merry band of characters on the LSU Sports Insider. And uh, uh, we'll probably have some sort of reduced schedule here in the summer because, well, hey, it's summertime. Uh, but when we return in the fall, uh, it'll be on Mondays and Thursdays in all likelihood uh, on all our social channels, specifically the YouTube channel, LSU Tigers on NOLA.com. Go there, subscribe. You'll never miss an episode. You can catch these guys live. If you don't catch them live, you'll catch them after the fact. I am subscribed. I'm never going to miss an episode because you That's guys good. are the best. That's good. We need subscribers. That's right. Good to know. Um, and so, uh, but I'll also be following along, and I will follow along also. Uh, I do have it subscribe. Uh, I'm following along on uh, Apple Podcasts. That's my uh, preferred rate, my preferred platform. Uh, and you can find them on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, wherever the finer podcasts are, going, are found. Uh, for everybody who's been uh, entertaining this poop show that we've got here going <laughs> this um very strange show that we have here that we uh, that we take a lot of pride in bringing you uh to everybody who has uh picked up the advocate or uh clicked on the advocate for the past 15 years thank you all so much this has been a dream come true uh and i don't take that lightly so uh it's it's meant a lot to anybody who's actually read any of my stuff any of these guys' stuff we take a tremendous amount of pride in our work so uh, i just want to say that to everybody out there thank you so much um, and with that, I'll wrap it up, you know, uh, for Scott Rabelais, for Sheldon Mickles, for the great Amelia Cotton, soon to be Amelia LaCour behind the glass, <laughs> who even brought pastries today uh, on my way out. Uh, I am much appreciated. Uh, and we thank you. I'm Perrin Keys. This has been at the LSU Sports Insider. <laughs>